Well, I got I got more hope for my parents and my brother tonight than I did uh, yesterday. <laughs> I really more enjoyed hope, more hope for my uh, grandma and grandpas that uh, have passed. I really, I really enjoy the fact that we'll tackle taboos, you know, and not think anything of it. Well, do we want to try to watch some more of this video? Yeah, I wouldn't mind. It actually, the last half is the most interesting of that, I thought. Let's see here. And it's been going on ever since. Revelation 21, we see what we see back in Exodus with the tabernacle when it was built. The Shekinah glory came down among the people of Israel and dwelt with them. And they followed that Shekinah cloud as it led them. They didn't go anywhere the Shekinah cloud didn't go. Right? Well, that's what's happening in Revelation 21. God coming down in the New Jerusalem and tabernacling among men. It's about the Father in the kingdom. Jesus did something for the Father. His ministry was for the Father. You see? I'm not saying that Christ isn't important. He made the whole thing possible. And what the Father and the Son are doing right now as I speak, I have no idea. I don't know what their current ministry looks like. I don't know what I don't know what they're doing in the invisible realm. Do you, in terms of specifics? But I know what they've asked us of all people of all times was to love him and love the neighbor, do good. We see what good and evil is in the Bible. We know what it is, even instinctively. Right? The law is written on our hearts. We know. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't commit adultery. You know what these things are. We know what the Ten Commandments are. Don't do wrong to people. And when you do ask, simply ask for God's forgiveness and move on. That's the beauty of the new kingdom. We don't have to go to the priests. We don't have to have animal sacrifices offered on our behalf daily. We don't have to be cast outside the camp when we become unclean for something we touched. Or a sickness we might have. And all the rest of it. That was the beauty of this. They're, they lived by simple faith in the garden. They transgressed the, the covenant at that point, which is don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whatever that was. That's not what we're talking about here. I've done other videos on that. But don't do this. Well, Adam did it. Eve did it. They're booted out of that covenant fellowship. And they entered into something other. And that lasted until Christ, the last Adam. See, that's the whole point. How, how often do we read about Adam in the New Testament, Christ being the second or the last Adam? How often do we read about the tree of life and about a restoration to that paradise? That was the whole point, Jesus coming to sum up the old so we could have the new. So what is the gospel today? Well, there is no gospel in the sense of their gospel. Their gospel was escape, flee from the wrath to come. We have no wrath to come. That judgment took place in AD 70. What is the gospel today? What is the good news today? The good news for them was, hey, you want to hear some good news? You don't have to be under this system of Torah anymore, the ministry of condemnation and death. But Christ came to fulfill that and start something brand new that everyone can come into. And what happened in church history after AD 70? What happened? Eventually those founding fathers who were Israelites or proselytes into Israel, those people died off as time went on, right? And who were the people coming into the kingdom of believing? Well, the national ethnic Israelites by and large rejected that message. Uh, that, that there was a new kingdom available for them. And so they went off and started some mutant form of Judaism, right? And non-Israelites were coming into the kingdom. 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, 1,500 years, 2,000 years, and here we are. And the kingdom today, by and large, is made up of people from all, not, not by and large, it's made up of people from all over the planet and always will be. Right? It's that mustard seed that grew into the great mustard tree. The great tree that the birds of the air come and rest in their branches. 
So I hope that I'm going to conclude it here. I'm not negating the work of Jesus at all. I'm glorifying it. I'm praising it. But people say today you need to have Christ forgive you for your sins. And so forth. I, don't, I don't hold to that. That gospel was for them. It was Messiah, their Messiah, their king, right? Who sat on the throne of David for 40 years. Okay? Then he concluded that system of Israel with their kings and so forth. And started a new kingdom where there is no earthly king, right? But God is king. Oh, there's so much more to say about it, but I wanted to keep it as simple as I could today and as short as I could, because once I go past a half hour on these things, fewer, fewer and fewer people seem to watch them. There's so much more to say about this, but I hope this is enough for you to run with, right? I'm glorifying what Messiah did. He made it possible to have the new kingdom, but he was their Messiah, not mine, not yours. That's going to shock some of you. You know, but that's the tradition of men, that, that view. This is not scriptural in my estimation. Jesus came to do something for national, ethnic, old covenant Israel. He came to save them and rescue them out from their prison, from their bondage, from their condemnation and death, spiritual death. Once they were made alive, he handed that kingdom over to the Father, and now we worship the Father in spirit and truth, just like he promised. Well, that's it for me today, guys. Take it, ponder it, read through the scriptures, and see if it doesn't hold up. Okay? They were the church of Christ in that trans... Okay. I will like to say this. I've never seen this guy before on YouTube. I've never heard anything about what he was saying, but when we were pausing the videos and I was trying to sort of uh, extend his point, then when we watched the videos, he was actually coming up with the same points that I was saying. And another thing is that when he was talking about how the new covenant purpose was for God to come down and tabernacle in us, uh, Rob, read Ephesians 2.22. That's exactly what that says. The night of 22s, huh? Ephesians 2.22. Yep. Of God through the Spirit, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Right. The other things that uh, I'll let you continue on and then I had a couple things too. Uh, that's basically it. Although uh, Zach has schooled me on what Shekinah is and Shekinah is not in the Bible. So that's. Gotcha. That's I thought it'd be interesting because uh, I was kind of wondering about the good news because Revelation 14, 6 says it's an everlasting gospel. Right. And. He did talk about the good news a little bit, but is it one of those things where everlasting doesn't mean everlasting anymore? Or I'll just jump to that real quick, see if there's anything to see out of that. Well, you know, we, we have the same arguments with the Constitution. Is the Constitution a living document or is it just to be interpreted word for word the way it is? Because it says Revelation 14.6. Let me... Uh... I saw another angel. He was flying high in there. He came to tell everyone on earth the good news that will always be true. It's kind of a different way to say it. He told it to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And then Look at 13. Seven. seven? Okay. Yes. So he's, um, he's proclaiming this gospel and then he's saying something in verse 7. In a loud voice, he said, have respect for God, give him glory. The hour has come for God to judge, worship him who made the heavens and the earth, worship him who made the sea and the springs of water. So have Amen. respect for God, worship him in spirit and truth. That is the everlasting gospel. So, yeah, so I wanted to, and then uh, verse 13 and I heard a voice from heaven, right? It said, blessed are the dead who die as believers in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Holy Spirit. They all rest from their labor. What they have done, they will not be forgotten. So is the Lord here Christ, God, 
often the same. Doesn't make a difference if it's God or Jesus. I think we should listen to the rest of his video. He he's not finished yet. Okay. I just want to point out one other quick thing before we go to the <clears throat> video. Um, Revelation, because we talked about, you know, he's talking about do we need Christ, right? Well, in Revelation 22, I think it is, the end of the book. Let's see. These are the people that don't get in. Uh, let those who wrong keep on doing wrong. Um, oh, here we go. 2215. Outside the city are dogs, those who practice witchcraft. Outside are also those who commit sexual sins and murder. Those who worship statues of gods and everyone who loves and does what is false are outside too. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say those that don't believe are outside. You know what I mean? So you're back to a gospel of works. Well, faith for sure. Well, without works, faith is dead. So mm -hmm. you've got that. It's kind of that fruitless thing. Stacy was talking about, you know, and then you get back to the, the scale. Okay. How good are you? Am I 49% good? Oh, uh, now I gotta, I gotta do two more work so I can get to 51%. But also, um, the, or is the there no more sin that we don't have to worry? All right. So the founding fathers of the United States, they were what George Washington, Madison, Hamilton, those guys, you know? Yeah. So because of the actions of those individuals, we as Americans today have those freedoms. So we're, we're benefiting from that, uh, even though, you know, we weren't in that time, we didn't have to fight that war of independence or anything like that. So in a way, I think he's saying that the work of Christ is something that we benefit from, just like we benefit from the United States founding fathers. If you're American, of course, I know we got a token Canadian here, but you know, <laughs> uh, anyway, she wanted us to watch the rest. I think there's something else. Yeah. Are the people that don't believe in Christ now benefiting from him too? Uh, that's what we're trying that's to figure out, I think. I don't think we know for sure yet. Maybe we'll, maybe something will come. At least I'm not for sure. I don't know if anyone else is for sure. No. Well, the good news is either one of two things. It's either that because of what Christ did, you're saved. And in that case, the person doesn't even have to know the good news. Or the good news is Christ died for you so you can be saved if you believe. Let's say those two choices again. One choice is Christ died for all and all are saved. And that's the good news, which you don't have to really even believe it. So you can preach in that case, you can preach the gospel of an unbeliever and you can say, Guess what? You're saved, whether you think so or not. There's your good news. Take your good news. <laughs> whether you like it or not. Or, or, right. If you or, want to go to hell, you don't have a choice. You're going to heaven, buddy. I don't care what you say. Or the good news is that you can be saved if you believe in Christ because of what he did. It's either one or the other. Which Even one's the better? Day. Which one's the better news, though? Yeah, right. Because, I mean, how terrifying would that be? Well, how terrifying would that be that every single individual on the earth has to hear this message that Christ died for you if you accept it and if you believe, then you've got to think of what about the people that never heard that? that they're, are they're just condemned just because... Or they you, never heard the truth. 
didn't tell them the truth. So their condemnation should lie upon you, not them. Because it was your duty to tell them because no one told them. I mean, what do you do about uh, aborted babies or a kid that dies at one or two? You know, they don't even understand English. Right. You just have to say, well, that's because they're under the age of but account. You can't go by that. You guys can't, you can't, you can't go by that because what about the people pre 70 AD, pre Christ? Were they lost too, or were they not lost? Well, if anyone was were they, to be... Were they not under sin? Were they not under the law? Therefore, they weren't transgressing? Well, if anyone was to be condemned, it would be the people in that time that had God manifested in the flesh and refused to accept it. Beyond so just, the, all just, the the the, just those few people? Yes. Didn't get in? Yes. That does kind of go across the against the scripture that you will be saved and many will perish. Well, if, if you look at audience relevance and that few will be saved, many will perish because that. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. A few out of like, you know, uh, 144,000 were the few and then right. about a million people were killed. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. And who did God wink? I'm sorry. Who did, who did God wink at? The nations. The nations. The nations. Yeah, I agree with that. Did so you guys notice saved? the nations were saved? Yeah, if God winked at their sin. Maybe they just weren't condemned. What's the difference? Well, yeah, I, I can agree. I, I would say that they were not condemned. Yeah, maybe they so were. As far as the saving, though, that's, that's where, you know, you're saying they had to be saved for some reason. I'm saying it was Judah. It was Israel that needed to be saved. They were just not condemned because it says he overlooked their transgressions. Therefore, there was no condemnation. And what it happens, there was no condemnation because there was no law. Right, but that doesn't mean well, that why, well, So why did he go and preach the news then to them during that time? <clears throat> because it was at the time for them to draw near. Oh, so they could get to know the true God. Uh huh. Yep. Stop worshiping. Because there was some some confusion going on in the world. Right, and stop worshiping idols of silver and gold, because the true God now has saved Israel, and now and He has sacrificed. And so now salvation's through the Jews. Right. I don't know if it's through the Jews. It says from the Jews, which means the Messiah. Or of the Jews. Of the well, Jews. it's from or of salvation is of the Jews. You know how we try to, uh, you know, apply the uh, the rule of consistency to to, to every uh, belief system, right? Well, mm -hmm. this guy, I don't know if you noticed, this guy first said that in this new covenant age, and he does say we're in the new covenant, uh, we don't have the law. But then he says that we are to do this, that, and the other. Exactly. And he says, we know what the Ten Commandments say. Oh, now, wait a minute. What's wrong with this picture? No, he said we have the law written in our hearts. But he says the law doesn't apply. It was done away with. But then he says exactly. we know what so, the commandments say as if we're supposed to follow them. Well, no, you know good versus evil. You are to do good things. And if you don't do good things, you're not living a fruitful life. Isn't that sin? Well, it's it, no, because if sin is done away with, then it's basically fruitfulness or fruitlessness. So in other words, you could live life very abundantly or you can live life uh, impoverished. But regardless, you have life. But if, so if you do wrong, if you know good from evil, but you do evil, that's not sin. Right. That would be not producing fruit. Because of that one verse where Paul says, if there's no, what if Paul meant, if the believer. Well, not just that one verse, because Christ said he was coming to uh, put an end to sin. 
it kind of goes along with uh, the, t- the the Ten Commandments are all do not, do not, do not. There's and Christ's special. laws are do, do, do. Mm-hmm. Well, some of the, like the, in the Ten Commandments, there were do. You know, you were to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Honor like your that. father so and mother. Dues. But the, the problem is, if, if you don't want to believe that sin is done away with, then but yet you believe that the law is done away with, then there's some sort of dichotomy here because you're having to say, well, the law is no longer existent, even though it was the law that actually was the one that actually produced the sin. Well, John writes, like I said before, that if the believer sins, he has an advocate. So he's saying... Now, he's saying that a believer can sin. I it's know, plain, that, right there. Right, but that was po- that was pre seventy A.D. The law was still in effect. Not for the believer, because he consistently says they were not under it. You can't have it both ways. Th- those new believers before seventy A.D. are said to be not under the law. It's abolished. Rob, did you write that across the screen? I think Albert did. Oh, okay. <laughs> what did he write? What? What did he write? Is oh, it say Satan? <laughs> Is that what it says? Yes. Yeah. It says that. Oh, that's funny. He was playing with the um, writing utensil. You can write when it's not uh, recorded. <laughs> Okay, let's hear what this dude has to say. Satan, I think. This is his name. It's Elvis. <laughs> Elvis pronounced Shatan. Sh- Shatan. Uh, no, sorry, guys. I had to play a little prank on you. That was me. My bad. But <laughs> he we kind of figured that out. He's being a Satan to Matthew right now. <laughs> I think he's caught... I think he's causing a lot of people to stumble and it really pisses me off. I got to tell you. Really? Wow. Wow. Really? That, that is interesting. Cause I, how do you see people stumbling from this? I think, yeah, I think you should. Hmm, interesting. How do I think he's teaching you not, he's teaching you that you don't have to trust in the blood of Christ. He's, he's, he's I'd like to know how somebody actually trusts in the blood of Christ. Well, what you do is it's it's the Sabbath. It's the it's the message of the Sabbath. You know. You know old- what? I would be, I bet you ten out of ten, nine out of ten people don't actually know what that means. They don't actually. No, they do. Most of the church believes that you are saved by faith and not works, and that is the Sabbath. That's it's humble yourself and do no work. If, if the Israelites did work on the Sabbath, they were worthy to be stoned to death. You know, and that's why yeah. they wanted to kill Jesus when he picked. But I don't up. see how I don't. I don't. I mean, I think that we all believe. You know what? I don't even know what I believe anymore. It's been. That's it's, why this has been a year. Oh no! This has been an ongoing year for me. Right. Well, I'm not saying for you. I think this. I think this kind of stuff is making people go to and fro with every wind of doctrine and throwing people into confusion. I really do. This isn't something that I would fall for. This would take me a long, long time of research. But I do see a lot of it being, it could possibly be the truth, a lot of it. It has elements of the truth, of Mm -hmm. course, but so does every... So does every liar. You know, he's basically saying everything that was written in the Bible, nothing, it's not for us. Don't read Romans. It really, it, it matters not to you, Romans, what Romans eat. Why? Because it was only written to the Jews. The whole thing about Christ dying for your sins, that's the Jews, man. Don't read it. Why that's bother? Not, that's not the whole New Testament, though. Yeah, but I mean, that's what most of Paul's mission is to, is to try to tell you that 
you know, that those of the law are saved and faith is made void and the promise of none effect. He's trying to tell you that Israel was the example. You know, they, um, they sought after it as if it was by the works of the law, but the Gentiles are saved by faith. Right. Faith in what? Faith in God. No. Even the demons believe in God. That means nothing. Faith in the blood of Christ is what it doesn't the Bible say the demons have faith in God. It just says they believe. Right. Faith but... and belief are two different things. A biblical faith is basically placing your trust. It's it's not it's taking your trust out of your works and placing them on the work of Christ. But this guy is saying that the work of Christ is not for you. Well, you know what? I have faith and I believe that if we study this through and through, that one way or the other, we're going to figure it out. That's what I think. Yeah, I'm not going to back off It seems like we're getting closer to things lining up. Uh, I'm not going to back what, off what that something is. out of fear. What's that? Yeah. I mean, it seems like we're getting closer to things lining up, making sense, but still questions on the table that need to be figured out. Oh, yeah, sure. absolutely. But Matthew, uh, so you're almost in an irate state for what this guy is saying, because he, and you said that he's saying some truths, but some lies. So what I want to know is, the application of those lies. If we are to believe those lies and apply those lies, those lies to our life, how would that put us on the completely wrong path? Because he's preaching an anti-gospel. It's a gospel of works. And that's exactly what the Bible is, is teaching against. You have, to do, you have to do this now and you have to do that. That's works. And that's precisely what Paul yelled at the Galatians for. I didn't really get that he, you have to do this or that. He's like, basically, you should do this or that. That's the way I was getting the way he was describing those things, is these are things you should do, you ought to do, but not that you have to do. Well, what if, it's like what love I the hear, Lord your God and love your neighbor. What right. I want to hear from him is if he's actually a post-7080 universalist, because if he is then that could be another anti-gospel because like i said you the gospel is either you know the good news is god uh christ died for everybody but he's not saying that christ died for everybody he's saying christ died for israel this is where the, there's a disconnect here if christ died for israel then how does christ save you if he died for israel it makes no sense because he brought in the new covenant and the new covenant saves you? I thought yes. Christ was the savior. He's the no, savior he's, of all mankind. I think that he's saying that through Christ you were saved. And he's the savior of you or for you, isn't he? Yes. Think about it. Yes. Well, I, I am thinking about it. I'm trying to think about it. But we are to worship the Father and Spirit in truth. And that's the true worshipers. So it doesn't right. say anything about the status of the true worshipers being saved and justified first or anything like that. It just says the true worshipers. Well, I think what Christ was getting at there with the woman at the well is he's basically getting back to that, that playing field being leveled. Well, even look, though, with the woman of the well, you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. Obviously, she was in some type of, if she was an Israelite, she was in definite sin and definitely needed to be uh, saved, propitiated, justified, something like that. But that was never mentioned. He just mentioned to her, you know, the true worshipers will worship the Father and Spirit in truth. Mm -hmm. Right. But he had said, you know, also to Nicodemus, you know, for God so loved the world, cosmos, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever. I mean, the whole gospel message right there strongly implies that Christ came to save the world, among many other verses. 
Doesn't it depend on who he's talking to there? Well, if he came to save the world, is it uh, universal world? world or no. was the whole world, no. but but he, he now the, the, the whole world is not the whole world? He qualifies it by saying, whosoever shall believe. So plain. Isn't that kind of like uh, using uh, free will uh, terminology in uh, Calvinism? It doesn't really say whosoever, though. It says those believing. Well, I'm just saying, isn't it kind of uh, like an oxymoron a little bit? How do you have the whole world, and, but then some believing? You can't have them at the same time. Kind of like the free will and Calvinism argument. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't say the whole world will believe. It says, for he loved the whole world, that whosoever or who, yeah, who but is it does say he came to save the whole world, right? Welcome, Mr. Feinberg. Yo, yo, yo. What's up, What's that? That? As, oh, yeah. as opposed uh, to saving some. All right, so if you really look at the Greek, because I have a problem with the word whosoever, because whosoever means even if you don't believe him at this point in time, later, you know, you have the possibility to believe him, and that will, that will cover you. But that's not what the scripture says. If you look at the Greek, it says, for thus God loved the world so that he gave his only born son that everyone trusting in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. So it's basically those trusting in him. I know it might not seem like a big difference to, to some, but to me, who's whoever you are saying. Okay. And everyone trusting in him it changes the phraseology compared to whosoever. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're watching a video tonight, Zach. Uh, I don't know if you watched that, uh, that one about yeah. the salvation. Did you watch no, that one? I, I haven't. I was, it was just so funny. I was literally just going to ask, you know, what was the discussion, you know, about? So it's yeah, about so universalism. It's, uh, it's uh, universalism, maybe part of it. The guy hasn't really said if he's a universalism. That topic's actually been, uh, the gentleman said that Christ basically came to save Israel only, and that those that rejected him in between his ministry and 70 AD were, uh, you know, the wrath of God came on them basically. And yeah, then and after, after, yeah, and then after words, 70 AD, we don't need the blood of Christ. Not, not to disregard what Christ did, but that now we worship that Christ handed over the the kingdom to the Father, and now we worship the Father through spirit and truth and doing good things, or as well, Stacy put it, fruitful or maybe fruitlessness for some people. But is it still like, I guess, in like that covenant relationship, like Jeremiah 31, which would, you know, be that God's law. And yeah, instruction yeah, he's saying, yeah he, yeah, he said that, but then he went on to say that, you know, basically, you in know, we words, have to worship the Father. Go ahead, Stacey. In other words, what he, what he refers to salvation, salvation is being saved from something. Mm -hmm. And the way that the, the predominant Christian church believes is you need to be saved from yourself because you're a reprobate man. <clears throat> but if you look at salvation, then the only ones that needed salvation were those under the covenant. So with Christ, not necessarily. Uh, no, just listen. I'm telling you what okay. this okay, I the got video you. Okay. says. Okay. okay, I got you. <laughs> So don't jump down my throat, brother. Oh, I'm about to jump right on it. <laughs> okay, so, so listen. So when Christ was the sacrificial lamb, that was not for the Gentiles. He was the sacrificial lamb for the Jews to bring them out of the old covenant. However, mm -hmm. in Ephesians 2, it says, because of the blood of Christ, you Gentiles are able to be brought near. So mm -hmm. there is benefit from the Gentiles from the cross but it's not concerning salvation. 
And then in John chapter four, where he's talking to the woman at the well, and he says, salvation is of the Jews. You don't know what you worship. We Jews know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But there is a time coming when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. And mm -hmm. so basically what, what he's saying is the cross actually creates a solid flat playing field now. But the, the problem was that the Jews had this ministry of death above them on the boot on their neck and that had to be released. And so that required the death of Christ for that. But we Gentiles are able to benefit from that death because of the shedding of the blood is able to allow us to brought near. And then in Acts chapter 17, you know, when Paul is talking at the Areopagus, and he actually mm -hmm. says, you know, in the past, God has overlooked your ignorance, yeah. but now, you know, you can come near and know who the true God is. And so that's basically what, what I took. Yeah, and he also mentioned that, you know, the first Adam, you know, sinned and that, that Christ was the last Adam and that, you know, we're new men now, basically under a new covenant. Yeah. And Christ is not the propitiation for our sin. Yeah. Yeah. John, first John two. So I guess what are you guys takes on take on it all? I mean, I'm pretty sure if it has something to do with open theism, then Stacy's probably like mouth like like foaming at the mouth. No, it, it actually it has more to do with universalism, which causes Matthew to foam at the mouth. <laughs> but, but, but I, I thought, mean, you're the only. You're the only <laughs> what I thought was really funny is that what we did is we listened to five minutes of the video, and we'd pause and we talk about it, and then we'd listen to five more minutes and we pause and we talk mm -hmm. about it. So when I was hearing this guy, and I've never seen this guy on YouTube before, I've never watched this video, but when he was saying something. I could actually see how he was seeing it through his eyes before he even did the presentation. I was bringing up scripture that later in the video he brought up. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, I brought up a few times that I've, that I've tried to bring in the past that, you know, sin's done for, but haven't really had anyone agree with it before, <laughs> but that we're maybe possibly seeing some light tonight. Yeah. But what do and you guys also, have to do about with, Romans chapter two, talking about, like, I understand the position that, yes, that only Old Covenant Israel was under the law and stuff like that, but it seems to indicate in Romans chapter two, Paul uh, specifies that Jew and Gentile are under the judgment of God, for both of them are under, you know, they broke God's law. They weren't, the Gentiles weren't given the law of Moses. But they did have a law that was written on their conscience. Well, we did talk about that a little bit about, you know, uh, were they under condemnation or not? We, we were, really didn't kind of come to any conclusion on that. Yeah, I think Romans, the book of Romans should is pretty, uh, in, my, in my understanding of it, is pretty convincing. I mean, you know, that's Paul. where Matthew was trying to go as well, somewhere in Romans. I well, don't think he went to well, two, the, but the thing uh, is, though, maybe you it, did, Matthew. The thing is, though, is that in Acts 17, when he's talking to the Greeks. Yeah, and, that's even a better place, too. And he's mentioning that in the past, God has overlooked yeah. your ignorance. But now, because the new covenant is being brought into the fold, yeah. now you can come near and, and, and you know experience the true God instead of worshiping idols of gold and silver. Yeah, I take that as as they were in times past. They didn't have relationship with God. They weren't. They didn't worship God. They didn't have a connection. So, with what God. about them? Were they automatically? Con was their condemnation for them? Did God um, not overlook their transgressions? They oh, he overlooked, but it was in a sense of not having to come into covenant with God. They so, if he over, would you, then, would you agree back, then? Uh, would you agree that if he if he did overlook their transgressions or their ignorance that he did not condemn them for it um i don't think that he condemned i mean i believe there were those that were condemned of course you know pharaoh for example um you know, so there are examples in the bible where people that were not in covenant with god were condemned you know this you know, the people of sodom and gomorrah you know 
God even, uh, you know, they talk about the holy code of God in Leviticus. It talks about that the nations that the nations were going to be judged because they did these things. So why did God judge the nations and Israel destroy those nations for breaking some type of holy holy code that was given to them? So it seems like there were some type of standards that they were supposed to be held to that God did judge them to. And again, uh, Ephesians, uh, Acts chapter 17 that you're going to actually mentions that God has that the, God has set a day that he's going to judge the living and the dead or something like That's that. That's I was wondering uh, when you say he brought condemnation on them. It seems you're indicating that he brought death on them, but death comes to everyone. So I don't see how that can be the condemnation. Well, they were judged according. So however God judged them, he judged them to a particular standard. So which would be a law, which see, it seems like in this universalism or even in like the Israel only Hebrew roots, they kind of miss that part of it. Because they'll be like, oh, only Israel was under the law and things like that. But then they're missing a lot of key things that Paul brings up in Acts chapter 17, in Romans chapter 12, in Acts chapter 13, you know, there's all these places that it seems that maybe they're, they're overlooking. Um, but I think, like I said, Acts chapter 2 is pretty powerful if somebody believes that the law had only to do with Israel, which it is true. Like, that's what's tricky about Paul is he uses the phrase nomos. And then in, within the context, you have to kind of find out what law he's talking about. Is he talking about the law of Moses? Is he talking about the law of Christ? Is he talking about the law of the land? Is he talking about, you know, what law is he mentioning or the law of the Pharisees? So there's different types of laws that we have to decipher. So again, going to Romans chapter two, it seems like there was a law that was given to the Gentiles that they were going to be held accountable to. I think that this guy is pre-70 AD, Israel only, post-70 AD, universalist. I know, but it seems even before 70 AD that Acts chapter 2 was written. I mean, uh, Romans chapter 2 was written. So it was already judgment on the nations. See, that wasn't written after 70 AD. Right, because that's a special time period for two reasons. You have Christ manifested into the flesh at that time, and then afterwards you have all these miracles that was taking place you know, by the apostles, by the early church. You know, uh, people were being healed by Paul's sweat rags yeah. or by Peter's shadow. And so because of those events, that not accepting or recognizing those things as this is God's bearing witness to the message and for you to deny that in that first period time frame, yes, you would be condemned because, you know, this was, you know, God bearing witness of himself and yet you chose to look away from that. I mean, I can but see then after 70 AD, right? We don't have people being healed from other people's shadows or, you know. I mean, you don't have that in your, you, I mean, you have later in the gospel, in, in the New Testament that, you know, Paul has to say, hey, give him some wine to for his drink. Why doesn't he just send him a shirt? Or why doesn't he just heal him? It seems like the major healing and the major things were happening. I mean, yes, you have Acts chapter 28 where Paul, you know, heals um, the guy's dad. I forget well, every name. time, most times you have miracles being manifested in the book of Acts, it was in front of Gentiles. Um, not. Yes. Well, not in the beginning. In Jesus's ministry, the, the, they, the miracles were done as signs. Yeah, they were done. They were done as signs for the, I mean, that's what uh, most of these signs well, were the for. <clears throat> we're doing it signs for the Gentiles. Okay, what about when, when Peter heals the guy and says, gold and silver, I have not, you know, but what I have is, you know, in the name of Jesus, stand up. Was that guy a Gentile? 
that's one of the ma- the first major, you know, awesome things that, you know, in healing wise, Peter does. And that was to a Jew. How many minutes we got left in this video, Rob? You said, I can't read it. Uh, six. Should we finish it up real quick? Lori says. I, w- I wouldn't that- mind he- hearing what you guys think of the rest of it. Okay. Yeah. I'll just play it to the end and then we'll go from there. period until the body was resurrected and they became the new kingdom body during that 40 year period there were the they were the ones who were trusting that messiah would rescue them from the wrath of god to come so they were the body of christ at that point we are not the body of christ today we're the resurrected body in the new kingdom you can call that the body of Christ if you want, because he began. But that's deceptive in the sense that if someone comes to you today and says, I want to be a, I want to be a follower of the God of the Bible, we call that a, being a Christian, a follower of Christ. And then we apply all these things that Christ applied to Old Covenant Israel. We try to apply them to people today and say, you need to be justified, right? You need to be glorify or you're going to be glorified in the future sometime but right now you need to be justified you need to be sanctified you need to be saved from the wrath of god that was to come no because it already came that wrath was for israel there is no future wrath of god to come there is no future lake of fire for the destruction of the wicked that took place in ad 70 and that was the burning of the city of jerusalem that was the the fire that destroyed the old covenant system the judgment Yes, that already all took place. But you're, of course, people are going to get all screwed up when they, when they try to take these passages that apply to Old Covenant Israel and their justification and their glorification and their need for the propitiation and their need for the shed blood of Christ and their need to, to go before the great white throne judgment and come out as either a sheep or a goat. You, tr- you can't apply those things anymore. That's what full preterism should be teaching. Those things were applied right the judgment of the sheep and the goats the wheat and the tares the great harvest the marriage the resurrection the adoption all that took place and the goats were destroyed and the sheep were left and then in essence god says okay now let's begin something new okay guys um i'm gonna finish this i'm in a different spot here but uh i had to go and so i got somewhere else here and i'm doing it in the jeep but here's the real mind blower and i hope you're sitting down because this is the real crux of the matter here the resurrection of jesus is described in the new testament as a sign it wasn't about his uh physical body dying and coming to life that wasn't the 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 crux that wasn't the, the the emphasis was not on that it was his dying to as an old covenant man and coming to life as a new covenant man being the first fruits from among the dead in other words he died to that adam life he died to that moses life he died to the life of torah and came alive to the life out from those things now 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 follow me here because this is a mind blower If you were an Israelite in the first century before AD 70 and you wanted to enter into a new kingdom and you wanted to enter into the new covenant fellowship with God, you could not because you were condemned. You were guilty under Torah. You would have had to have died physically because that was the requirement of the law. They were only temporarily covered over their sins were by the animal blood. But what was required from God was their death, their biological death for their sins, for their law transgressions. So if Christ hadn't come and offered himself as the propitiation, if he had not redeemed them and bought them back from something, right, bought them out of something, then they could have never entered the new covenant kingdom when it arrived. They would have had to have died physically and then come back to life again so that it was like a brand new life. So they could start over again out from Moses, out from Torah, out from Adam in that ministry of condemnation and death. So Jesus did it for them. That's why it was a sign, right? It was an indication. In other words, I'm going to set you free from Torah, from that condemnation from that unjustification, from that guilt, 
that you have before God, and I'm going to pay the entire price in its entirety. Therefore, you'll be justified. You'll be sanctified. You'll, you can be glorified when the new kingdom comes. You see? So Jesus is saying, for you, I will go to that cross and be the sacrifice in your stead, in your place, a substitutionary death and coming to life again so that the Father will have it all summed up in me. I will have satisfied the wrath that he would have poured out upon you. He will pour out upon me and I will satisfy his judgment against you. And so you will have a sentence of not guilty passed on you without having to biologically die and come to life again. So you could be a new man out from Adam, out from under Torah. Isn't that mind blowing? Jesus did that for them, not for me. He did that for them in order that they could enter the new man. He pushed them back from something. He redeemed them. They were God's possession, then they were under this curse, and he purchased them out of the curse. I was never under that law curse. Neither were you. But Christ made it possible for them to come out and start this new kingdom that I am a part of and that you are a part of, hopefully, by simple faith and grace. That's the work of Christ. All right, guys, that'll do it for me. I'll see you next time. Ponder these things. Thank you. I don't know if he's universalist. He didn't get there. And he said, hopefully, and it's by faith. Mm -hmm. By faith in what? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty. Uh, I mean, I can see some of the parts, you know, like, for example, like the judgment, you know, was then. But I mean, even Jesus Actually, talks about in John chapter, uh, what is it? John chapter five, I believe, where he mentions that, you know, we've passed from the judgment actually uh rob had mentioned that he believed that this was a a video in response to what joel had been putting out because this was done a year ago this was posted a year ago and you know how joel was thinking well he couldn't accept full preterism because the judgment you know yeah but he's worked out those problems now right and so uh this is Rob had thought that this is probably a video because of how he was struggling with, with those things concerning the judgment before. And he was trying to apply how the judgment did apply to AD 70 and, and trying to apply what that looks like for us now. Yeah, here's a scripture in John chapter five, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my words and believes the one who has sent me has everlasting life and does not come into judgment, but has removed himself out of death into life. So in that sense, like, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I believe like right now we're not going to come under a judgment. You know, there's, you know, if you're in Christ, you're not going to experience that second death and then anything like that. But I guess in a sense, because I'm just coming into it now. I haven't like heard the whole video. I, mean, I heard what you guys were saying. Um, I don't think he would say that we can be in Christ today. Yeah, he was saying that, you know, Christ handed over the kingdom to the Father. You know, basically, you have to have faith in the Father, worship the Father in spirit and truth. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree, benefit. but that's what Christ... Ministry of Christ. I mean... In my He's view, saying that Christ made that possible for us. Right. Yeah, I believe he did that 2,000 years ago, not in 70 AD. It was, you know, he made that way. That, is, two, that is 2,000 years ago. Well, not technically, but. Well, pretty darn close. Yeah. Well, what I, I should have specified what I meant. I mean, I don't think that, um, like, again, during this 40-year period of this millennial period or whatever period you want to call this time period, um, you know, this was applied to them. They passed from judgment. They were into life. And I think you know, that guy would agree with you on that. I think but, he would call the millennial period 
that yeah. same period that they reigned with Christ. And then after that, Christ handed over the kingdom to the Father. Yeah, and that's where I don't see that okay, as then, like an end right, of Christ. All right, yeah, but let me ask you this, because mm-hmm. we've asked we've asked this before and you were like unclear. Okay. What does it look like for Christ to hand the kingdom over to the Father so that the Father could be all in all? What does I, that look like? I believe um, it probably wouldn't look too much different. Um, it's just that now the end of the old has happened. So now truly it's just the kingdom of God. There is nothing else that's in the way. That's you still this, established. Uh, missed this earlier, but I asked, uh, you know, if the, if it has been handed over to the father, how does that affect people that don't believe in Jesus, but they believe in the creator or like Stacy mentioned, uh, you know, like uh, Muslims, they believe in the God of Abraham. That's the same God, but yet they don't believe in Jesus being uh, buried and resurrected. You know, if if the Father's all we have to have faith in, you see see where I'm going with that. No, but it seems like that the Bible teaches that to have eternal life is to know. Jesus Christ, because First John chapter five mentions. I'll just go there real quick. First John chapter five mentions, and we know, and this is verse twenty it says, and we know that the Son of God has come, and He has given to us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So again, it goes back to, you know, God being all in all. Well, Jesus Christ is God. They are one. So once it's handed over, it's just now this complete one kingdom, one everything. There is no longer an old. Everything is made anew in Christ. But again, the only only way to know truly who God is, is through Christ. And again, I don't see that when he hands the kingdom over to that, like, you know, does away with Christ and Christ is no longer needed because there are so many verses that are like emphatically clear that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, this messianic kingdom is forever. There is no end. You know, you can look up uh, in Ephesians chapter three, where it mentions uh, the body of Christ and things like that. Let me just go to that real quick. When you go, let's go back to John five twenty before we oh, skip yeah, over okay. that real quick. No mm-hmm. <clears throat> it says, "We also know that the Son of God has come. He has given us understanding. Now we can know the one who is true." Mm-hmm. So all this gentleman is saying is because Christ came, now we can know who is true. Yeah, and I believe that's still important. Yeah, I believe that this this verse points back to Jeremiah 31, which is the the new covenant, because the new covenant is all about Christ, is no longer anyone saying, hey, know the Lord, for all all shall know me from the least unto the greatest. Well, the same Greek word to use as to know the Lord is found here it's strong number 1492 and strong number 1097 to know and to have the understanding it's only through christ you know so again, well, that's what it, i was asking i mean if you don't believe in jesus like some people believe like jesus was just a person yeah you no, made up they the, don't they don't they don't believe in the resurrection and the uh, death burial and resurrection but yet they believe that God created me, you, Jesus, mm-hmm. all that. Now, would they be able to have eternal life? I don't believe uh, that that is the true God. They've made a God in their own image. They've made up uh, attributes of God. It's not. Um, so, I mean, let's say they we, believe everything in the Bible, but they don't believe the death, burial, and resurrection. Would I mean, they... Paul makes it pretty clear in 1 Corinthians 15 that without that, then our faith is useless. So it really comes down to yeah, what saves you is your knowledge. 
I mean, this is why God, it says in times past that he looked, you know, he passed that, you know, however you worded it and however it's worded in Acts chapter 17, but now requires men everywhere to believe in Jesus Christ. Well, this is what the new covenant's all about. Is said, no, 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 no. If you go to Acts 17, 30. Yeah, I'll go to it right now. Okay. It says, truly then God overlooked the times of ignorance, but now strictly commands all men everywhere to repent. I know, but look at the above. Look above. You got to go one above. And yeah. Below. Then men being of the offspring of the family of God, we ought not to suppose that the sovereign deity is like gold or silver or stone engraved by art and the imagination of man. So, so again, in the context so of that. Doing, look, look. So what he's doing is he's saying, but now. He commands all people everywhere to repent. Yeah, so but what's the context of what? Yeah, but what 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 they were doing? Yeah, to believe in the true God. Were, if you read up above, it talks about that in verse twenty-four: the God who made the world and all things in it. The one being the master of the heaven and earth does not dwell in handmade temples. So Paul is revealing to them that your understanding of God is wrong, and I'm going to show you the true understanding of God. And that's what he does. If the, if they were okay with doing that and that was fine, then he should have just been like, you guys are good. You guys are, you know, you're worshiping the way you guys feel, you know, whatever. No, you no. Guys want. He actually says that you should repent from those works of worshiping gold and silver. Yeah, repent, of course. But if you look at that stream throughout you're saying, the entire. You're, you're saying that it was saying you need to believe in Jesus of being the Jewish Messiah, that even though he's the Jewish Messiah, he somehow going to be your messiah also even though you are you know okay Gentiles. so if you look at the next verse after that it talks about the resurrection of the dead so if resurrection was the hope of israel daniel chapter 12 what does it have anything to do with these gentile pagans resurrections only for israel according to if we went with that logic and we're consistent with that because again verse 31 in the video was that you know you had to die for your sins and your transgressions in the old covenant that the blood from the lamb or the bulls or goats could only temporarily justify you but it really didn't that that the only way is for you to actually physically die and now because of the new covenant and for the judgment coming upon you you don't have to physically die well, here's the thing. So if we keep going with chapter 30, look at verse 31. So again, if you if 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 it's just repent from worshiping gods of gold and silver, but look at the next verse. He says because. So the reason that you need to repent <clears throat> is because he has set a day in which he is going to judge all the world with righteousness by the man whom he has chosen. And he so who's the man whom God has chosen? I would say that's Christ, and he turned every man to have faith in him. So that's, again, Christ, in that he raised him from the dead. Who did God raise from the dead? Christ. And hearing of the resurrection of the dead, some indeed ridiculed, but said, we will hear you again concerning this. So again, here Paul is obviously pe preaching Jesus Christ. So it's not repent just from gold. Zero. It's you guys. You're reading, are, you're reading from your Hebrew roots Bible again. Yeah, I'll go to the. Bible I mean, too. it's still the same. And even like the King James. Yeah, I'm, I'm a few just different go to words. Because I, I mean, I do it's not. It's still like the same, it. I would say. Well, not I'm going to just go here. Let, let's just read it real quick. Acts chapter 17. Let's see if I can interpret it the same way. So again, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in richness by a man whom he has appointed. Okay, and he gave, and uh, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So again, that's Jesus Christ, hundred percent. Right. So Jesus being raised from the dead mm -hmm. is a sign to show you that our message is true and just. Yeah, but you should repent from your works of worshiping silver and gold because the true God wants you to draw near because he is seeking the true worshipers to worship him in spirit and truth. Yeah, but you don't see that that what Paul is saying is you have to repent and believe in the one whom God has chosen, the God, the, the, the person that Jesus, well, Jesus what Christ. We're, what we're saying is there could be a possibility that because Jesus came, mm -hmm. 
we already know that true God. We, yeah. Stacy put up. Yeah, Stacy put it this way earlier. Uh, you had the founding fathers like George Washington, uh, Jefferson, Adams, Hamilton, those guys, yeah. uh, Benjamin Franklin. Well, now we reap those benefits living in America or uh, North uh, North America, even Canada and Mexico, and all that mm-hmm. yeah. benefits from that this guy's just saying that we benefit from Jesus coming back then now to know the true father. And they at that time couldn't have known the true father unless Jesus came. Same for us. We couldn't know, but since Jesus already came, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, we're, and, we're, and I, and we're I agree. reaping the benefits. Yeah. And I agree with that, but, <laughs> what it sounds like what I was presented was that um, it was for Israel that they were the ones that had Christ die for them, not the nations, the nations um, right. were going to yeah, reap we're still, benefits, we're, that's still on the table, so, but yeah. they didn't need to believe in Jesus Christ to have salvation because they were never under the law. Now, if that was the case, what Paul says in Acts chapter 17 is just, why why would paul present that so in my mind what i understand of this israel only or what this what you guys are talking about is that mm. it was yeah, for you got israel. It right yeah israel needs to repent the nations don't they were never under the law they never they never sinned like israel sinned like mm-hmm. what it what stacy said that they had the, that israel had the boot on their throat and that needed mm-hmm. to get taken away and then now everybody reaps from that benefit But it seems like here in Acts chapter 17 that Paul is in this Greek pagan arena, this 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 city, this the town hall, or however you you want to say it, and he sees these pagans worshiping these false idols. And then Paul goes to them and doesn't say, Oh, well, you guys are Gentiles. It doesn't matter if you're worshiping wrong or a pagan idols you guys aren't even under the law of Moses. you guys are fine but actually what he does is he says but he does it really nice because paul becomes all to win all and he says it in a way where it's really receiving that like hey you know i know you guys have these idols and all this stuff but you guys even have another idol that you've made that you've named the unknown god and he says i want to sh- talk to you about that god and then he says, that God is the real God. He's made everything. He made the heavens and the earth and out of every nation made one man uh, through everybody comes through this one man that he created. And, and even your prophets have wisdom that, they're, that he's gleaming from that show this divine deity of God. And then it gets into this verse 30 where he says, hey, you know, truly God overlooked these. This is the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Right. Well, Absolutely. Why? I agree everything that you just said. But the thing is, is for the Jews, when Peter was addressing the Jews in Acts chapter 2, what did he say they needed to repent from? They needed to repent from rejecting the Messiah. These Gentiles never could have the possibility to reject the Messiah because they never knew him. They need to repent from their works of unfruitfulness, of worshiping gold and silver but they still need to put the same faith this is why in galatian acts chapter 10 they were they were shocked that they're getting saved just like the gentile the, the the jews are getting saved they're receiving the same holy spirit they're receiving the same benefit there's no distinction of when they got saved so how could a gentile be saved and be saved the same way through faith, get the same gift of the Holy Spirit that the Jews were getting if it wasn't one and the same. So again, going back to Acts chapter 17, this is all nonsense if it's if what you're saying is true, because again, these Gentiles do not need to repent. They do not need to believe in Jesus because that didn't apply to them if what you're saying is true. But this is why when I look at passages like Acts chapter 17 and Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 13. I'm I'm not quite saying that you're, you're sort of presenting a straw man to a degree. Um, 
and all love. But what, what I'm saying is that because Jesus died, Paul is actually going to the Greeks. He's actually having the opportunity to talk to him that he never would have done that without the death of Christ. Amen. And in Ephesians chapter two, it says, it says clearly that, you know, you were strangers, but now you are able to draw near. Israel was never a stranger. Well, not so the blood no of Christ allows the stranger to draw near and the blood of Christ allows the Israelite propitiation for the sins to remove the old covenant that they were under. And so it's, it's the same work uh, to bring access to both peoples to create a level playing field from that point on. And would you say that the Gentile needed to be reconciled the same way that the Jew needed to? No. Well, in, Act, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16, he says, And he reconciled both in one body to Christ and destroyed the enmity through the crucifixion. So yeah, in Ephesians chapter 2. That, point, that reconciled is between the Jew and the Gentile, not between God and man. Okay. So, but again, it, it seems that they're both receiving this, like there's no difference that, you know, what the Jew and the Gentile are being saved from. They're both being saved the same way. They're both reaping the same benefit and they're both being at the same status. They're reaping the same benefit. They are, but, but, uh, have the same status now. You're correct. Yeah, but, but why? The actual work of the cross was different for, because he said, I come for the lost sheep of Israel. You, you Samaritans do not know what you worship. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. What did they need to be saved from? They needed to be saved from the old covenant ministry of sin and death. Yeah, but then Jesus I got says, a, yeah, a different, sorry. different question for the panel. I don't know if I quite asked this. <clears throat> I kind of <clears throat> talked about it, but maybe just proposed it a different way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can we know the true God without Jesus? Can we explain who God is without explaining who Jesus is? No. No. So then we have to have Jesus, don't we? Amen. Yes. That's the whole point. So, I mean, it seems like if you, if you can't... If but you can't having, know, Jesus, having Jesus is how you interpret that because remember if he has turned over the kingdom to the father mm -hmm. then what what role does jesus play for us well the, that's what i was thinking the role the cross, right i was thinking about that say you bump into someone uh like we talked about earlier that's never heard the news or heard about christ but they maybe heard of a god or they believe in god how would you explain to them who God is? What I, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't explain the Father. You'd have to explain what Christ did, it seems like. Because I, I, can't, I can't think of anything about God that I can explain other than uh, he created everything. I can, I can do that. Well, I would say um, that there was a Messiah that was a Jewish Messiah that came down to earth. And he had a mission, and that mission was to bring the Israelites out of the old covenant that was a ministry of sin and death. And mm -hmm. in so doing, that he worked his work on the cross. And from that, the, the early apostles and the disciples were able to share who the true God, the Father, is. And so now, as Gentiles, we are allowed to draw near to God. We are allowed to know him because of the work of Christ. Mm -hmm. well, I'm just saying, uh, I don't see how we could, uh, you know, explain to anyone. I don't think out. anyone, I, I don't think this guy on the video is saying, well, you don't even need to mention Christ or, you know, Christ now is irrelevant to us. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I, I know that, you know, that's the way that, you want to like debate the video and say, well, you know, Christ is relevant. Well, he never said that Christ was not relevant. 
Well, he's saying that we don't need Christ for salvation, though, right? Right, because of that salvation was for the Jews in the Old Covenant. They were being saved from the Old Covenant. But, well, I'm just but, thinking to be saved, we need to know who God is. Yeah. I mean, again, it still just makes like no sense in my mind that like, because again, the Gentiles are being saved the same way, getting the same Holy Spirit, the same redemptive work is being applied to their lives, believing in the same Jesus. Right. So it's just like, it makes so much more consistent it's, sense to say it's the same across the board and Jesus did die for the Gentiles than to explain it this way. Well, it's the, it's the same well, I thing. think it... The oh, work God, of the cross, so the work of the cross is uh, we get the same benefits. So it, let's say, for instance, you have a husband and a wife and they live in a home and the husband is massively in debt and the husband has been saved from the debt by a benefactor who pays off that debt. Mm -hmm. That wife didn't have to be saved from that debt, but yet she is reaping the benefits because she is able to stay in their home. I think I maybe have a, a clearer picture of this video than we talked about it before, but maybe just to summarize it or clear it up. They needed, they had a blood sacrifice system. It was temporary. Mm -hmm. They needed a final sacrifice in Christ, a final blood sacrifice. We don't need that blood sacrifice. Yes, we need to know who Jesus is, what he did, and believe on him that is buried, died, resurrected. We need Jesus, but we don't need his blood sacrifice. It even says that the Passover or the, yeah, the Passover supper was until he came a second time, that blood. And after he came the second time, we don't need the blood anymore. Yes, we need Jesus, but we don't need that blood sacrifice. I think that was the point of the video. Yeah. You guys right. mind if I read a quick uh, couple of verses? Please do. Colossians 119, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. I, I think speaks, that ends it all. This speaks directly to this stupid video. Yeah, and this is a Gentile church, by the way. Yeah, but that was for their time, though, right? I guess I don't get what you're saying. It just, like, kind of blew up that guy's whole premise. How that the, so? That the Gentiles, that, and I even asked Stacy, like, they don't need to be, like, again, like, if the Gentiles don't need to be saved from sin, they don't need, because they didn't break anything, they're reconciling was different between the Jew because the Jew broke God's law per se. Like the law let me, let me put it to you. Let me put it to you this way. Yeah. The Jews didn't, didn't need to be saved from the old covenant. The, the Jew, Gentiles. I mean, I'm sorry. The Gentiles did not need to be saved from the old covenant. The Gentiles do need to be saved from being far off from Christ, from God. If, if I put it that way, would that make sense? Yes. The Gentiles need to be saved, but their salvation is is being drawn near to God. The the Jews were being saved from the old. Yeah, the word they were re, 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 reconciled is drawing near. It's the same idea. Yeah, but it's through. But again, it's through His blood. So it it has to be the death has to be applied to both Jew and Gentile. So basically, right. it's only through so, the blood so that we're reconciled. All right. So basically, to to present the gospel to a Gentile, you first actually need to make them into a mini proselyte and teach them about the old covenant sacrificial system no. for them to understand the shedding of the blood of Christ no, for Paul, them. No, Paul did it perfectly. To. Paul did it perfectly in Acts chapter 17. 
Explain. Acts chapter 17, he, he, he goes to them and, and, and presents like, hey, you guys are worshiping, you know, all these idols. But I want to talk to you about the idol that you kind of have in yeah, the background. Yeah, bring in the blood, though. Don't forget the blood part. Yeah, well, he brings in and tries to connect that, hey, you need to believe in the one whom God has appointed. That that's the one that you needed to believe in. That he, the one that God raised from the dead. And then did, if you did, did they get salvation or did they get peace through the blood? And then you look here and it says, because um, it seems like in verse thirty-two, and hearing of the resurrection of the dead, some indeed ridiculed, but said, "We will hear you again concerning this." And so Paul went out from their midst. So it seems like here. So again, you have people that heard the message, heard what Paul said, said, I want to know more about it. Let me hear more. And then it prob most likely Paul would tell them more about it. Tell them more about who this child, who this um, chosen vessel of God was. Because again, when you read these letters that Paul wrote, like, uh, like we were mentioning Colossians, that's written to a church. That's written to an actual congregation that already believe in Christ. So again, like even in... Um, so basically, you would say then to present the gospel to a Gentile, you would say there was this Jewish Messiah. He came down, he died, but he rose again. And because he rose again, now he's also your Messiah. Yeah, he is the Messiah. If you believe in him, then yeah. Because again, okay. here's another passage in Romans chapter 5. So in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 9. I'm going to skip to verse 9. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. So again, this is to the Roman church, which you have Jew and Gentile, which is both groups being justified by his blood. So the blood's not only for just the Jews. It's for both groups. And I believe what, you know, Matthew quoted in Colossians is, I mean, that, you know, it's, yeah, that's done. In my book, I mean, again, I'm just some guy with a Bible, so. He actually mentioned earlier in the video about justification, that what did you need to be justified from? And that that was old covenant concept, you know, the justification part. And so he actually applied that to the first century church as well. But then post 70 AD, what do we need to be justified from? I think is the way he was presenting it. But, you know, this is the first night that I've heard it. Uh, I can kind of see through his eyes, the way he's seeing certain things. What do you make of uh, Matthew twenty eight nineteen through 20, Zach? And Matthew... What's the uh, the passage? Uh, Matthew twenty eight nineteen through twenty. Oh, that's the uh, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit until I come or whatnot. Uh, is that what it says? It's like the last part. I'm with you uh, until the end of the age, whatnot. Let me see. Yeah, so yeah. I am with you to the end of the age. Yeah. So Christ was with them until seventy eight D. Well, and he was with them in. To a, in a particular way, I, I would imagine right. in, in that particular way, way the he spirit was there of God. The, end of the age, and then he turned the kingdom over to the Father. Well, it wasn't because again, Christ went away. Christ did go away, but he didn't leave them orphans. So he technically, the spirit of God that was in them was still Christ, because it says Christ in you is which is what he just, Lord. which is what he said. That's what he yeah, said. So he's not leaving them. But again, when the end of the age comes, that doesn't mean that Christ just disappears because in Ephesians chapter three, it says that the body of Christ. Well, no, no, no. I mean, let's, let's read 20, 19 and 20 and see if they go hand in hand. Yeah, they do go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So, when it says, how do you make a disciple? You teach them and you disciple them. You don't just tell them one thing. You continually were discipling people, just like what we're doing now. Right. This is so discipling. You, you're discipling by 
learning the good news, right? Yeah, it's a continual growth. It's it's helping that believer grow in the Lord and continue, just like what we're all doing right now. So does that mean when it says, I am with you always to the end of the age, that we don't have to make disciples after no. that point? No, he's just saying, and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. It doesn't say, because again, you know, uh, oh, let me see. who Who's with you to the end of the age? Well, in this context, it would be Christ. But it doesn't. So why, why? Why isn't he with you after that age? Well, I that believe it, it would be to the Holy more. Spirit, and then after the Holy, after the seventy A.D. Now it's God all in all. It's the whole. You can say the Trinity, the Unitarian, or whatever. It's that mm -hmm. entity. It's the, the Father, Son, God, and the Holy Spirit being one perfectly. No longer do they need three separate roles. You mm -hmm. know, it's all just one god being all and in all and then this is when the god's old, the god god has come all back together basically you could say so i mean some people say that like it's like transfer but again i still believe that if you saw god it's because again the father is a spirit the the physical carnation uh of the body would be christ so he would be what you would see of god so, so in again, revelation 14 6 where it says everlasting gospel or everlasting good news that would be a true everlasting oh for sure like look at ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 and 21 it says now to him being able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think according to the power working in us to him be the glory in his congregation ecclesia the body of christ in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And amen. Now I've never actually really looked this up, but uh, Don Preston says this so much in this verse says he uses multiple Greek scholars that say that this phrase generations forever and ever. Amen. Is emphatically the most um, forever timelessness or eternal Thing that has no end that the greek language can even produce and if the if the greek language is the best language to convey a message that the words used here is a is perfectly chosen by paul to show that the body of christ is forever and ever and ever so if we need the body of christ forever and ever and we need that everlasting news and revelation 14 6 matthew doesn't that mean that there's going to be some type of sin forever well the thing is is that people that aren't in christ they have sin and this is why john chapter 3 is is a vital passage to understand that without christ you're already condemned you're already not because that that's how i'm really like what separates you from God is not being in Christ. Yes. Sin is like, if you want to break it down, like, okay, you've committed sin and, and everything. Well, but Matthew would define sin as not believing. I would exactly. Believe. And that's mm -hmm. the, that's the real main truth. It's not that you, yes, you've, you know, lied and you've hated and all these things, but really it's because your sin is being accredited to you because you're not in Christ. You haven't been forgiven. So truly the only sin is, is not believing in Christ. Cause if you believe in Christ, then according to John chapter three, you have everlasting life. So what about first Corinthians fifteen fifty six? Oh, that's the, about the, uh, the sting of death is the law. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So again, that, that so what be... law was done away with for, let me go there. Again, I still see That's that sin. phrase. The power of sin is the law. So would you say then if that's done away with you being a full preterist, that sin is powerless now? Or because you still believe I believe there even sin before that absent from the law. Yeah, I believe before that they you know, these people had already passed from judgment into life. If you believe in me, you shall never die. So these things they had already experienced because this was a forty year period where it was kind of like a cross between old and new. So so, so this verse fifty six then applied to the first century church. Yeah. So how do you prove the death, burial, and resurrection? 
um, there's many uh, scholars that have made many videos. There's this one, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, this one movie actually that there's a famous like uh, I don't know if he was a detective or a news writer or something like uh, that. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I and think he of his made name, a case. Uh, the case for Christ, whatever. Yeah, something like that. I mean, that's a good, you know, thing if you want to just quickly like look at that. But I mean, it's really, I mean, technically, the New Testament, the Greek New Testament, is the most, uh, like antiquity out of all writings in antiquity. We have more manuscripts than any other thing ever. There's even like when you want to talk about like Alexander the Great and all these other people, you're talking about minuscule writings that date back hundreds and hundreds of years after the fact of those people alive. We have testimony written within years of when this stuff happened. So you're talking about we have stuff that dates to the first century and that these writings, the, the, the people that wrote it, actually were eyewitnesses and actual like proof that this happened no other writing in antiquity can prove that except the bible just because we have more of them proves no because uh, like for example um you know the farther away from you are from the source like in time right uh, you know the most likely it could be mm-hmm. you know there could be false things in it sure but we have like with Paul and things like that, this is years after the death of Christ. This is like, you're talking about firsthand eyewitness testimonies that we have that wrote the stuff. So you're not talking about, oh yeah, you know, I knew a guy that knew a guy that knew a guy 300 years ago that said this stuff about Jesus. So this is why we believe it. No, we actually have the eyewitness testimony of the people that actually lived there that wrote the stuff down. Why do some people believe those that, they weren't real witnesses though that they just made it up well one of the biggest things is is i would say 100 percent of the time people would not die for something that they know is a lie and these people willingly died for it stephen willingly took that stoning you know so normally people don't tend to you know, because again, well, you gotta I mean, think look about at it. the Muslim, Muslim faith. People blow themselves up all, all no, the time. No, because they believe that though. So mm-hmm. if these Christians knew that it was a lie, they they knew that Jesus so Christ. So you would didn't. say the Muslim faith's a lie, right? Well, the, I believe it's a lie, but they don't believe it's a lie. So what I'm trying to say is that a lot of people would say that, like for example, Jesus didn't raise from the dead. His disciples just went to the tomb and took his body. And, and then they, they said, oh, Jesus raised, rose from the dead. Look, he's not there. Right. And then it's the Christians making it up that, oh, Jesus, you know, they say he was raised, but they know that we know that he stole the body. Right. So if these Christians really knowingly know that they stole the body, that the resurrection was a made up lie by the Christians, why would you die for that? Most people, when you're getting tortured and you're getting put like, on the thing you would just be okay no it's, I, I made it up you would tell the truth you know if somebody was torturing you about to kill you right now you would be like okay no i hid the money in my basement you would give them what they're asking for so stephen died who else died oh i mean james a, yeah died. james i mean there's peter died i mean yeah, peter died paul died i mean all these people um John. died so that's like five or six people. Yeah, and then there's so many more. I mean, it's, you know, Paul murdered, and so it's not written, but it's written that uh, many people died. You know, well, even... I, well, I asked this question earlier tonight, you weren't on, but uh, why don't we have any writings of the temple being destroyed, or why don't we have any writings of the second coming happening? Well, we have. From right... the church fathers, not from Josephus. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Um, I mean, I know that there are. Um... Hmm. Dude, I don't know. I've never really looked too much into, but I mean, definitely the temple was destroyed. That's a fact. It's not there. You would um, think that the early Christian church fathers would have, you know, mentioned it. I don't yeah. know whether they did or not, but Rob is under the impression that they never mentioned it. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I don't know full detail of the church fathers. Um, again, these are 
the church fathers now, so this is the difference between the New Testament writing and the church fathers. A lot of the things that the church fathers wrote are they're writing things that, especially they're talking about Christ and things. They're writing what they heard from what they heard. So like, for example, there's one um, church father that actually said that Jesus Christ was 50 years old in his ministry. And the proof text was because when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees saying that before Abraham was, I am, the Jews say, hey, you're not even 50, like, aren't you, you're not even at least 50 years old yet. And you're saying that you're before Abraham. So that one church father was like, oh, well, Jesus must have been around 50 years old because the Jewish people said, you know, you're not even 50 right. yet, you know. So there's some things that the church fathers, like, you know, I don't, you know, want to be like, oh, yeah, they're, they're perfect, you know. But like, for example, one of the biggest things that I do like about the church fathers is the flight to Bella, which proved that the church, that not one Christian was killed in the siege of Jerusalem because they fled. So if we look at that church father, well, what did they flee from? They fled from the Roman invasion. So there, that's a, a, an allusion to the destruction of 70 AD. So you can just Google flight to Pella. And you can think, I think the, the church father was Arana Ar or Irenaeus, I believe. Let me just Google that real quick. Oh, flight that to Puerto Rico now. I just want to say that if you guys meet up together tomorrow and have lunch, which I'm really looking forward to it, take lots of pictures for me. <laughs> yeah, Matthew, you still on here? Yep. Hey. So, yeah. My, so, brothers, my brothers are getting together. I can't believe it. It's I know. fantastic. Yeah, I'm excited. Dude, it's like, <laughs> uh, dude, it's so crazy. I remember when I first met, like, you know, when I first went up to Georgia, I met Dustin. He doesn't come on here anymore, obviously, but I had Dustin and when Stacy, I mean, it was like, wow, it's like I hang out with you guys more than anybody. And now I'm actually like meeting you. So it's crazy. So tomorrow's going to be awesome. Pretty wild. Yeah. But where we're going to go, I don't know. But so I guess you did. Let me just say, I think you probably did text me back, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm leaving it up to you because you know the places and um, I could drive near you or we could meet halfway. I mean, just to let like you know, Matthew, Zach called me and he was freaking out. Like, I don't know where to take him. Like, <laughs> I don't know where he needs to, where he wants to go. It's got to be keto. I know that. That's what he said. <laughs> uh, no, you can do keto from any restaurant. I went to I went out with my friends today. Mm -hmm. We went to a Thai you live by the ocean. There's plenty of keto food. Yeah. I mean, I'm not yeah. big on seafood, but. What kind of, what's your favorite food? Like if you had to pick like a last dish, what would it be? Oh man. I don't know. That's a hard question. We don't Bacon, have. Bacon, eggs, food. avocado. Okay. Let's not bring up the last dish now. Yeah, that's true. Okay. A little <laughs> yeah. bit of dish that you really like. Uh, I eat bacon and eggs every morning. So I'm, I never go out and get bacon and eggs. I, yeah. I make that at home. Yeah. Um. It could be maybe somewhere that has a real nice omelet. Is there any place like that? Nah, I'd rather go somewhere that has either a good burger or a steak. Zach loves meat, so yeah. Do you guys, uh, do you guys have sin burgers down there? No, I've never heard of it. How about righteous burgers? You got righteous. Burgers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean. Oh, I'm so bad at picking restaurants. Me and my wife just go to like <laughs> Chick Fil A. <laughs> I saw on on the headline in our uh, local paper today was uh, this couple celebrates their anniversary by coming to a town in Nebraska every year. And they, the way I read the headline, anyways, that they they try a new place every year, A through Z, and they're up to like X now, and they have nowhere to go. Oh my God! They have to make their own restaurant. <laughs> Chick Fil A isn't bad. Chick Fil A has a like. Um, I've only been there once, but I I saw in a keto uh, video they have. How about a, Chick Fil A? Is delicious. We could do Chick Fil A. Sure, they have a grilled chicken salad. Yeah. Have you, do you guys have a? Oh, they're they're an unwitch place. I can't remember who that's the name of them. Have you guys ever had an unwitch? Uh -uh. No. It's basically like a. Uh, 
Um, like a Jimmy John's. Do you guys have Jimmy John's down there? Yeah. So it's like Jimmy John's, but instead of getting the bread, you get lettuce wrapped all in your sandwich. Okay, gotcha, yeah. Sounds keto. I saw one place that they do pickles as the bread, like a big pickle <laughs> that they that they shave the inside out a little bit, and then they throw your meat and your cheese and your mayonnaise and your mustard. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, but I, uh, yeah. I mean, I want to get, I want to treat you to a nice lunch. I mean, Chick Fil A, Albert, Albert got a nice salmon steak. Ooh, yeah, like I mean, we could probably meet. I know, um, which is somewhere in the middle, which is Boca. Have you ever heard of Boca before? Yeah. See, Boca is. I don't want to. You know, I'm not throwing you into a rich place, but that's a more you know in the middle, and it's very nice. There's lots of restaurants. Yeah, that sounds better. So where, like. I don't know. I don't just don't know. I might have a place for you. Y'all just need to yeah, meet at the me. gas station and then from let there. Let me see if it's still there. Or Boca. <laughs> see, I think I just don't want to bring you to the most expensive place. I think there's a place like J. Alexander my mom told me about. Let me see. J. Alexander's. Um, I mean, they got steaks and stuff. Um, you know, the Boca. Book now. They open Saturdays, yeah, 11.30. Yeah, they got steaks. I mean, you're trying to get a steak or... Um, yeah. Are you... When you say Boca, you mean... Is that short, short for Boca Raton? Yeah, that... Yeah. I forgot you're not from here, but... Yeah, that's Boca Raton. I mean, I mean it should be you? like... That's probably like... 25 minutes south of you and like 25 minutes north of me. Where are you at, uh, Matthew? Uh, West Palm. I wasn't sure if you were still traveling or... No, the, the reason I'm here is because I, I met a... Um, I did a big job for, a, for an architect about four years ago. And um, he's, he's a little bit older. He's about 12 years older than me, him and his wife. Um, and we became uh, very good friends and they uh, they invite us they have two condos here in the same building one right next to the other and they're always empty so they basically tell us anytime we want to come down we can so they uh, he's from Romania and he's got he he stays in Romania a lot he's got an office in Romania and an office in Manhattan and they just came back from R Romania. They came here uh, for a vacation and they invited us so that we could not only come here, but we could also hang with them. So and when they get together, doing. they debate all the time about something or another. I forgot what it was. What was <laughs> he, it? Likes, he likes to debate the flat earth. Oh, okay. yeah, the flat That's what it is. But uh, I'm avoiding Maybe. it like the plague. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> have you guys ever ate at uh, Ruth Chris's Steakhouse? Oh, I've never been there, but I think that's too way too high to roll there. What, Ruth Chris? I think so. I think those are like $60 for a steak. I don't think they're that bad. I've ate them in Kansas City before. They're so good. I've heard of it, though. There's one by my house, but like I said. They have like so much butter in the steak. It's oh, so good. Let's see here real quick. I'm on their website right now. I know this place is way too much. You're okay, uh, Matthew, you're gonna absolutely love Elizabeth. No, she's she's not Is Elizabeth know. coming? Um no. Oh wow. I mean, I think she said um oh, what should we call? I know she has to do something, but I don't know what time. I mean, maybe she can come. I mean, you want her to come? You yeah. got to let me know, because if Elizabeth comes in, I'm going to bring Rochelle. Okay. You I mean, would love I got, Elizabeth. I got, Elizabeth is a blessing to me, I'm telling you. I have just two little kids, too. So when you go to restaurants with them, it's kind of like, well, you right. already know how it is. Kind of bumps it up. Yeah, it's kind of, you know. But whatever. I mean, if you want, you know, the whole fam to come, then it looks like it's it's totally up to you. Just let me know. But uh, um, Rochelle kind of said, you know, no, I'll hang out here and 
know, watch a movie, you go. Yeah, I mean, if I mean, if she wants to, I mean, maybe my wife and her can hit it off. I mean, or if you want, you know, just me and you, or you know, maybe she wants us to. I don't know. It's that's a. I mean, well, my my girl feels like staying. So okay, so it'll just be me and you. So I'm trying to find out how much that costs. Okay, yeah, it's like forty bucks for a, f- a little piece of meat. Yeah, you're right. But it is really good. I'll tell you that. But I I, I don't have it very often. It's not in my what hometown. Is that? This is called Ruth Chris. Yeah, that that's a very nice. But that's like a high roller, like you were saying. Like, I even think everything's like a la carte too. So, um, yeah, that's expensive. Well, I just took my mother to the. Um, neurologist yesterday at Jasper, which is about, you know, an hour away. And so on the way back, we stopped at Longhorn. So I had a $26 uh, steak and it was delicious. Yeah. Like these steaks are most likely like a ribeye steak is probably like 50, 60 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. There's always, you know, much higher levels of meat that you could buy. You You can buy like a, $10,000 $10,000 hamburger in New York. Yeah. <laughs> so when y'all go, when y'all go out to eat, see y'all can go to the movie theater and watch star Wars and tell us all about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is the, uh, like I said, I mean, there's a nice place called J Alexander's. Well, that's funny. I looked at it as soon as you said it, that's gotta be it. So we're going to J <laughs> there <you> go. <laughs> Yeah, there's one in book. I mean, there's a few of them. I mean, there's one. Calvinism. He's going to be a Calvinist by the uh, after <laughs> lunch tomorrow. Oh yeah, you already know it. <laughs> Let's see. Hey, Alexander. Let's see. Yeah. I mean, they got you know specialties. I mean, their steaks is a little expensive. But, yeah. Burgers. Oh, yeah. Don't worry about it, expensive. It's a special occasion, man. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be so much fun. Zach's going to order the filet mignon now. <laughs> well, in that <laughs> case, we're going to Ruth Chris. <laughs> uh, no. No, is this place good? Uh, Jay Alexander? Yeah, no, they're good. Yeah, they got, I mean, yeah, it looks like their steaks are like 30 bucks. 27, 29, 36, 37, 37, 29. Slow roasted prime rib. All right, that's it. We're going to go there. All right, Tito. And you're saying at what time? Uh, can meet there at 1130. Okay. By the time we eat. All right, so 1130. But I'll text you in the morning and let you know. I mean, I'm pretty sure that should be fine. I just got to talk to the boss. And just so you know, Matthew, maybe you've forgotten, but I'm going to tell you, Zach's hugs are very long and soft. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty a weird description. But... <laughs> uh, uh, well, That's funny. Yeah. Well, then... Uh... Matthew, you need to give him a short bear hug then, and you guys can meet in the middle somewhere. That's <laughs> <laughs> funny. No, yeah, my, hug, my hugs will squeeze the life out of you. <laughs> oh, don't do that. Bring your inhaler, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I really think uh, if we could try definitely um, to uh, set a day or a date this upcoming year for all of us. Can you do me a favor tomorrow, please? What? I'm sorry, I'm getting touched. (laughs) I want a photograph of my brothers embracing. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure the restaurant would do that for you guys. Sounds like a plan. I think we could do that. Too, too. Or, or if you can find Kevin from uh, the Adam and Eve creator out on the beach and get you take a picture. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, they are going to be, you know. yeah. Yeah, the, the, whoever was created before Adam and Eve, if you can get one of them to take a picture of you. True. 
or get true. them in the picture with you too. Yeah. Definitely. That's cool, but yeah, I hear you. It would be cool if we could all meet up next year. No, it's gonna happen. Yeah, I would love that. That would be so much fun. But we would need to pick a time where it's nice and that it's awesome. Yeah, it might be fun to meet out at my parents. They got a lot of beds and stuff like that, and it's in the mountains and nice, but you know, it just depends on how it is for travel for everyone. You know, it's not the, necessarily the most central location for everyone. Although it would be for uh, Lori, it kind of kind of match up and for Lori for us. That is true. You're on you're in the west, right, Lori? Like by British Columbia. I don't think she's on. Is she? She fell asleep. Oh no, she was still on. But yeah, she had a busy oh. day today. We got one tomorrow too. She says she's gonna have a busy day tomorrow too. All right. Yeah, cutting hair is definitely. Uh, what was that uh, church fathers one that you were saying? I couldn't find it. Pella. Yeah, you just type in flight to Pella. Okay. Hey, dudes, yeah. I'm going to bed because I'm really tired. And I got a big day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Got to meet up my brother Zach. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I got a. Yeah. And in I, the morning and my yeah. And unfortunately, I got to wake up at probably six o'clock in the morning. And it's almost two now. I know I'm screwed, but I'll be fine. <laughs> Good night, guys. Go yeah. Right. Good night, everybody. Right. Fantastic day tomorrow. <laughs> Good night, Jose. Good night, everybody. Good night. Night. Night, Albert. Night, Laurie. Night, Stacy. <laughs>